Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all here back again this morning, helping us kick off the second day of our conference. Um, I got a chance to preview some of the presentations this morning. I can tell you made the right decision to be here. Uh, this is definitely the place to be for Naja Talks this morning, and that is hashtag Naja Talks. <laughs> um, since this is the start of a new day, um, I'll take a quick moment to introduce myself and then, of course, the speakers, too. Um, and I also know we have some new arrivals. My name is Mary Huditz. I'm the president of the Native American Journalists Association, and I am a member of the Crow Tribe in Montana. I'm also thrilled to be here with all of you. It really means so much to see so many talented Native journalists and broadcasters in the halls of this conference and in this room right now. There are 310 of us here this weekend and counting. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is our highest attendance figure in years, um, and, it's hap and our growth is happening because of you all. I, I know Naja knows, as well as our partners, uh, Native Public Media and Vision Maker Media, that you are all here out of a commitment to your own careers and a commitment to engage with other journalists and give back to our vibrant community. And I can't stress that enough over this weekend. This particular event for Naja specifically marks our 30th annual conference. And I know, as well as many of you in the room, that this is not an organization that can sustain itself on autopilot. It takes vigilance and dedication and vision. And it's amazing that this all has taken place continuously for three decades for the good of Indian country, starting with Tim Gallego, and going from one, from one board to another and one president to the next. And I also believe that NAJA exists for the good of the news industry, too. In the US, NAJA is the bridge between the industry and our Native people and our communities. And I believe it is essential. This morning, our NAJA Talks is all about vision. And we'll touch on the essential nature of who we are and what we do and the questions we need to ask ourselves. It also look at thoughts for the future. And the presentation offers all of us a chance to collectively think about solutions together. Our speakers are Mark Trahant, Patty Talahangva, Karen Lincoln Michelle, and Duncan McHugh. They'll lead us in exploring key topics that fall nothing short of asking how we are currently being represented in the media, what does it take for our major issues to get the attention they deserve, and how do we ensure stronger coverage among Native and non-Native journalists? And how do we make sure we are counted? Because we certainly know we count. I want to thank our speakers in advance. Mark, Patty, and Karen, as many of you know, are all past presidents of NAJA. Duncan is a phenomenal First Nations journalist based in Vancouver, where he works for the CBC. Duncan, thank you for joining us. Very happy to have you here. Also, thank you to FNX, First Nations Experience, is doing great things, and they're growing, too. Um, they'll be filming, filming this event today, and the talks will be available soon after the presentations have ended. If you could, though, please engage in the discussion via social media, but put your devices and phones on silence. Um, given that we are videoing, we want to make sure it's, well, we'll, we'll have, a, we're ensured to have a great experience here. We want to make sure once these are shared, um, the rest of the world gets to enjoy the presentations as well. Uh, no flash either, please. I suppose. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. Um, there'll be opportunity for questions and answers once the presentations have ended, so please stick around for that um, and enjoy, enjoy the Naja Talks. Thanks. Nukwang Talongva, Nukutaku Kingmana, Yan Hopi Matsiwa. Look, Patty Talong, but young Pahan Matsiwa. Look, Patki Wunga, but Kao Wunga. Look, Titsumovit Anko. Hello, my name is Patty Talongva, and my Hopi name is White Spider Girl. I come from the village of Sitsumovi on First Mesa in northeastern Arizona, and I am Corn Clan and also Water Clan. I just spoke to you in an American Indian language. It is my language, and it's called Hopi. There are more than 500 federally recognized tribes in our country, and each has its own distinct language, and they are as different as English is to French. So, as Native Americans, we have our own distinct language, culture, 
religion, and also governments. And yet still I have people who come up to me and ask me, do you speak Indian? No, I speak Hopi. So I rep um, this represents the mindset of European Americans who came to this country and just couldn't get over this idea that so many distinct tribal people lived here, again, all with their own language and culture and such. And that's the problem, the misrepresentation and misunderstanding of American Indians in our country. We have been trying to educate European Americans for more than 500 years. It still continues to this day. I'm here to talk about Indian 101, the basics, because that's where the conversation starts for most of us, right? Most people get the basics wrong. Let's start with this term Indian, okay? We all know who we, can ha we have to thank for that misnomer. And for the record, American Indians, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, all of those terms are equally wrong. We identify as our own tribe. I'm hoping my friend identifies as Chickasaw, my other friend identifies as Akuma, Grovant, and Clinkett, and so on. But I get that it's hard to remember 500 plus federally recognized tribes. So we don't expect you to. So it's okay to call us American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Americans, or just simply Indians. But please ask us how we like to be identified. I mentioned again, there are more than 500 federally recognized tribes in our country. And that means the US government has given these tribes the A-OK -okay to be Indian. They have proven their Indianness, and they are now federally recognized. That translates into federal money, right? Spelled out in our treaties, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But let me add, there are hundreds of tribes in our country who are either state recognized or who are going through the federal recognition process. Until then, they do not have access to federal funds. So this is a good time to tell you that American Indians are the most regulated people in our country, right? Um, and we still don't have a paid holiday in our honor. And you know what? Thanksgiving does not count. Okay. Some of us have cards that show that we are enrolled as a tribal member. Um, we do have dual citizenship. But please don't ask me, what is your nationality? I'm American. I think when people are asking me that, what they're really trying to say is, what is your ethnicity? We are an intriguing bunch. Um, <clears throat> on the positive side, people see us as stoic and mystical. And on the negative side, people see us as drunk and ignorant. We have these misconceptions in our history and in our lives today because American Indian history is not taught in any depth in our schools, in our public school system. Federal Indian law is not even mentioned. And so people do not understand this federal to federal relationship American Indian tribes have with the US government. And in my humble opinion, we graduate whole classes of ignorant journalists, politicians, and voters because they don't understand that, re that, that uh, relationship between the tribes and the federal government. Here's a brief history. When uh, the Europeans first came to this country, they went to war with the tribes over land. But in that time, they also signed treaties with the tribes because they recognized the tribes as sovereign nations. When this country was created, the US Constitution was created. Tribes were specifically mentioned in the US Constitution. It is in Section 1, or yes, Article 1, Section 8 of the US Constitution. And in fact, we are the only people specifically mentioned in the US Constitution. We have that federal to federal relationship. Still, our government was trying to kill us off, right? All in the name of westward expansion. So, um, some tribes, uh, well, back up a little bit here. We were in the War Department when, we, when it was first created, and then eventually we became uh, parts, part of the Interior Department. And so like our national forests, we are national treasures as Indian people. Okay, so back to, <laughs> yes, applaud your national treasureness. So back to our treaties, okay, and the idea of uh, funding, right? Um, we have this idea, or non-Indians have this idea, that we get free money from the government that we don't pay taxes, and that our kids are going to get a free college education. And that is so far from the truth. So what is the idea about federal money? Well, through the treaties, the tribes do get money, right? And it's for things like infrastructure, education, and um, housing and health and such. But you know what? It's never enough. 
it's not enough because the allocations are not made in any significant uh, way to fully fund these kinds of programs. Let me sidestep into the world of Indian gaming, okay? Because that's another misconception Native Americans have. You know, we all have casinos. Actually, there are only 28 states in the country that have Indian casinos. And only a fraction of them are actually making any kind of decent money, a lot of money, right? So remember I talked to you about being the most regulated people in the country? Well, Indian gaming is a highly regulated business. And in fact, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act even spells out how tribes can spend their money they make from the casinos. And they also state that the tribes must share a portion of their profits with the state. Think about that for a minute. So we are nations within a nation, and we are in our homelands, but displaced. In many cases, in term, uh, in, for so-called progress, right? When the US government couldn't kill us off, they decided to Americanize us, to make us as white as possible. They took our children, kidnapped them, and put them into government boarding schools where they made them, tried to make them as white as possible. Cut the hair, change the clothes, and only speak English. So, today, we have generations who were ripped from their culture, who didn't fit in there, and when they returned home after schooling was over, they didn't fit into their own tribal communities. And yet, because of the color of their skin, they weren't accepted into mainstream society. So we have issues. Among them, alcohol, OK? Most tribes don't have a fermented drink. So it was easy to become addicted to alcohol. And sadly, many did, and still do today. Here are some sobering statistics in Indian country. Our life expectancy is 73 to 77 years of age, and that is four years less than the national average. We suffer from violent crime at a higher rate than any other group of people in the country. We have the highest rate of type 2 diabetes. Our diet has changed considerably since European contact. Consider the fact that before Europeans arrived, we did not have beef. We did not drink dairy or eat dairy products. We didn't have wheat and most refined sugars. We had natural sugars. Our diet has changed tremendously. Our unemployment rate is at 70% on reservations, where 23% of the population live in poverty. Youth suicide is at an epidemic rate here in Indian country, and yet most people don't even know that. Youth 15 to 24 years old are taking their lives at, at um, four times the rate of the national average. In some tribes, that rate goes up to 10 times. And if you're in Alaska, you may as well double that number. That's how bad the suicide rate is among our youth. To muddy the waters even more, prominent images that dehumanize American Indians cause our children to suffer, whether they realize it or their parents realize it or not. Caricatures as Indian people, it does not help who we are. Take a look at this image here. I don't say the R word. Most Americans don't even know where it came from. But here's a picture of a bounty hunter with the scalps he's collected and money he will get for those scalps. Remember, westward expansion at its finest. I don't want to leave you with all doom and gloom, OK? One of the best things Indian people have going for them is our sense of humor. We see humor everywhere even when it hurts. So in closing, I want you to know that yes, we can make it rain. Yes, we speak to the animals and the plants. No, we will not give you an Indian name. And yes, when I go to a restaurant, I always have a reservation. I hope I've stirred your curiosity a little bit so that you go out and learn more about Hopis, about Akamas, about Chickasaws and Clinkets and all of those other people who are mistakenly known as Indians. I want to say Esquili, that means gracias. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching. I'd like to uh, start by acknowledging that we're on the traditional territory of the Ohlone peoples.
Almost all of the students at the UBC Graduate School of Journalism where I teach are non-native. So on the first day of my reporting in Indigenous Communities course, I hand them a fill-in-the-blank fill cultural competency quiz. And here's one of the questions that's on the quiz. Sometimes when I interview an Indigenous person, I feel blank. The answers that I get, sometimes when I interview an Indigenous person, I feel uneducated, anxious, nervous, unsure of myself. Those are hardly ingredients for a good news story when a reporter feels intimidated before they even pick up the phone. Yet in Canada, reporters are regularly dispatched to cover Aboriginal communities and they're expected to hit the ground running just like they would for any other story. But for a lot of reporters, it's not like covering any other story. Going to Indian country is, is like going on foreign assignment. It's foreign language, and foreign food, and holy cow, they may not even have cell service there. <laughs> I've, I've talked with experienced reporters who, who are reluctant to cover Aboriginal issues because they know the challenges that they face, the distrust that they sometimes face when they go into Indian country. So it really shouldn't be any surprise when reporters feel like this that Aboriginal people are underrepresented in the mainstream media. Here's a study. Three years of coverage in Ontario, which is Canada's most populated province, 0.28%, 0.28% of all the content over three years had any Aboriginal content in it. When uh, Aboriginal people in Canada are about 4% of the population, that statistic is shameful. It's shameful, but it's not a surprise because study after study after study here in the US and in Canada has shown us that Aboriginal people are consistently underrepresented in the mainstream news. That wouldn't frustrate me so much if the fixes weren't so obvious. We need more Aboriginal reporters, period. I'll say it again, we need more Aboriginal reporters. At the CBC where I work, about 2% of the reporters and the producers are Aboriginal. At the other networks, barely a blip on the radar. It, perhaps if we tied our manager's performance bonuses to something other than ratings, to their success at recruiting diverse candidates, maybe that would change. But, but even if we achieve employment equity in our newsrooms, and that's something to aspire to, even if we achieve that, reporters that are coming to Indian country are forever going to be mostly non-Aboriginal. And so that's why I think it's essential that we offer some kind of cultural competency training for those reporters. Every reporter should get a crash course in stuff like the Indian Act, residential schools, in Canada, Section 35 of the Constitution, Every reporter should understand something about the role of elders in our communities or about the notion of Indian time. Police forces in Canada get diversity training and that makes sense when, when a cultural misunderstanding could lead to someone getting shot. But what's it like for our people who are regularly blasted with headlines that say that our people are dying and that they're violent and that they're corrupt, and that they're poverty-stricken? What's it like for our youth, our kids, who get a steady diet of negative news? So, sure. a couple years ago, thanks to the Knight Fellowship at Stanford, I created a website called Reporting in Indigenous Communities, www.riic.ca. The idea behind that site is, for working reporters, it's, an, it's a tool that they could dip into at their desk and get some tips and strategies on how to report in Indigenous communities. And it's a start, but I really think that change is going to come from the reporters of tomorrow. So three years ago, we launched a course at the UBC called Reporting in Indigenous Communities. And the idea behind the course is pretty straightforward. For four months, we immerse our students in Indigenous communities, and we expect them to come back at the end of that four months with a substantial piece of enterprise journalism. We do teach them a little bit of Aboriginal history. We try to decolonize, uh, decolonize journalism education, 
But more importantly, we teach them cultural competency. We want them to be able to operate and understand Indigenous protocols when they go to those communities. How did we do the course? It was about relationships. We're lucky in Vancouver that, that Vancouver is surrounded by First Nations, and so we sought out partnerships with First Nations and tribal councils, and they offered us guidance on how to set up the course. They've offered up guest speakers, and they've opened up the doors to our students. How have our students responded? They've responded with amazing journalism. We've had stories about First Nation-run suicide crisis intervention teams. We've had stories about FAS support groups for Indigenous grandparents. We've had stories about sexual abuse for teen girls at one reserve. We've had inspirational stories about mixed martial arts and how it's helping train young youth. And we've had stories about spirit dancers and how they're trying to protect sacred waters. We put all those stories on our own website, but we also have made sure that they all go onto the mainstream media, where they've been on CBC radio, and they've also been in newspapers like Canada's national newspaper, the Globe and Mail. It's been a real success, and it's a rosy picture, but there have been some challenges. We need more Aboriginal students. Last year, I had my first Aboriginal student in the class. This year, uh, we'll have three Aboriginal students in the, in the first year cohort, and I'm happy about that. But we need more Aboriginal students. So if you're a Native student out there, and you're thinking about journalism education, think UBC. Not only do we have the RIC course, we also have a nude beach on campus. <laughs> I've never been there. <laughs> um, the other challenge has been funding. Uh, we, UBC funded it as a pilot project. That money has run out, and so now we're trying to look for a source of sustainable funding. That's turned me from journalist into fundraiser. <clears throat> but welcome to the 21st century, journalists. I'm confident we're going to overcome these challenges, though. And, I, and here's why. Because in this fractured 21st century news environment, newsrooms cannot afford to overlook any potential audiences. And Aboriginal people represent audience members for you. And I can show them the metrics and the analytics that prove that these stories will win you audience members, new audience members. We can tell these stories, the mainstream media, and we can tell journalism that matters in Indian country if we build relationships with Aboriginal people. And if journalists go into Indian communities and operate respectfully, they'll be able to tell the stories, the good, the bad, and the ugly, without fear of someone crying racist. And, and most of all for me, I hope that in the future, that if you ask some reporter, sometimes when I interview an indigenous person, I feel blank, I hope that the answers are gonna be excited and curious and ready. Those are the ingredients for a good news story. Jimmy Glitch, thank you. Saturday morning, I got to just check my email like I normally do. I got this email from somebody I don't even know. Um, and he, he just basically said, very short email, just said, you know, I've been supportive, been watching this issue at, with what you guys are doing with the Washington team name. I'm not sure if this is useful. I pulled together this ad. If you like it and you're interested, let me know. And I get lots of, you know, people marketing things to me, but I just linked on it and pulled it up and... I watched it and I was just stunned and I had chills. Proud. Forgotten. Indian. Navajo. Blackfoot. Inuit and Sioux. Survivor. Spiritualist. Patriot. Sitting Bull, Hiawatha, and Jim Thorpe. Mother, father, son, daughter, chief. Apache, Pueblo, Choctaw, Chippewa, and Crow. Underserved, struggling, resilient. Squanto, Red Cloud, Tecumseh, 
and crazy horse. Rancher, teacher, doctor, soldier, Seminole, Seneca, Mohawk, and Creek. Mills, Will Rogers, Geronimo. Unyielding, strong, indomitable. Native Americans call themselves many things. The one thing they don't why we then went for our campaign. First of all, we don't have any money. <laughs> so that's why we made that campaign during the end of the uh, NFL season, which during the, um, the Super Bowl that just said the ad that couldn't afford to run. And that was a perfect campaign. And, and it just, people loved it. That first launching of that ad campaign, we got 1.5 million, you know, hits. The ad that couldn't afford to run. Proud to be. Of course, later that ad did run on TV during the NBA Finals. A campaign for changing that goes viral is the essence of media today. Really, it's the oldest form of storytelling, though. It's a campfire exchange, only digital. A story we hear and then pass along. Social media is our history. So once again, we need to be, as journalists, thoughtful about how to tell stories in a viral form and be thoughtful about what's going viral and how to make it so. The stories we have to tell cannot be told unless they are shared, reposted, repasted, resent, and sent around by all. Thank you. Have you ever reached a point of frustration where you've had enough? I'm not talking about with your family or personal relationships. I'm talking about the frustration that comes with consistently being left out. Left out of the kind of things that most Americans take for granted, like the public dialogue on issues that affect us all, or national studies and research that could have a positive impact on our lives. It took me a long time to get to this point but I can no longer accept that it's OK for Native Americans to be left out of the public dialogue. I'd like to see that change. In fact, I feel like I'm being compelled by something that only a Native person could understand. So I'd like to share with you uh, a story. Uh, I'll take a moment here. And it's about how the wisdom of our cultural ways propels us and gives us what we need to meet the challenges that we have. I am a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin. Uh, my father was David Lincoln Jr., who was a World War II veteran. His Ho-Chunk name was Wawahuska, which means he makes the enemy retreat. My mother was Ruby Little Sam Lincoln, and her Ho-Chunk name was Sogminanka, and that means rattling snake, poised to defend. Uh, those names really said a lot about their character and the kind of roles that they were destined to play. Both of them are gone now, but they gave me a great foundation in what it means to be a Ho-Chunk person. When the time came for me to get my Ho-Chunk name, my parents called on one of my grandfathers, and his name was Floyd White Eagle. And he was a highly respected person within our tribe. I was just a small child when um, I received my name, so I don't have any recollection of it. But I'm told that the sacred place where we held the ceremony was packed. And as it is with these naming ceremonies, 
all the relatives there say prayers that will carry this person throughout their lifetime. My grandfather Floyd named me Wakanchankmani. That means walks in the holiness of God. Um, when I was a um, young adult in college, my grandfather Floyd told me about that name. And uh, he told me that it was a family name that was passed down through the generations. And he told me about the kind of person who carries that name. And he said that this person has a large heart and is filled with deep love and compassion for people. This person is a strong believer in the creator of all things and is humbled by his power. The woman who carries this name prays for people and does what she can to help those in need. She tries to do good on behalf of her people. So with a name like that and a purpose, it's no wonder that I got into journalism. But I certainly didn't start out with that in mind. Growing up, I became accustomed to seeing my people ignored by mainstream society. Textbooks didn't tell the whole story of what happened to Native people. When I wanted to write research papers on issues affecting Native Americans, there was scant information, and that's still true today. When the media reported on communities, um, Native American communities, which was rare and still is, uh, the stories were generally slanted against Native people. Where was the truth? Where was the journalistic integrity? Where was the heart to care enough to get the story right? I reached a point in my young adult life when I decided that I needed to do something about the lack of attention to Native American issues. I didn't think of it this way at the time, but my foray into journalism was prompted by the power of my Ho-Chunk name. So I spent the last 25 years or so of my professional life trying to do what I can to reflect the communities that I care about. There is a lot of great journalism that's being done, but just not enough about Native people and communities. Many of us who have pushed for greater diversity in newsroom staffing and in coverage have fought the good fight and we've made some progress, but not enough. I see the digital age as a dawn um, for diverse communities and for Native people to get their stories told. But as soon as I started blogging earlier this year about Native issues, I immediately became discouraged because we are still being left out. We are being left out of demographic studies because we are a small sample size and it would be too costly to include us. But what is the real cost to tribes for being left out of these national studies? Data collection on American Indians and Alaska Natives is vital because it has the potential to sway public policy. My friends, I've reached a point where I can't take excuses anymore. In this country, there are 5.2 million Native Americans, including those who've identified as being more than one race. We matter. We can no longer rely on mainstream society to do the right thing and recognize us. We, as Native people and Native journalists, collectively need to seize this moment in this digital age and publish our own stories write our own histories, cover the world through our eyes. You know, some groups are already doing this, but, and that's really exciting, but we need more. And so, it feels like I'm being prompted again by my Ho-Chunk name. I'm pushing an idea that we cover the 2016 presidential election through the lens of Native America. Right. The time is right. 
Native Americans as a group of voters are rising in numbers at the ballot box. For example, the National Congress of American Indians reports that in 2012, in the midterm elections, um, Montana and New Mexico were um, registered to vote. Native Americans in those states were registered to vote at a higher rate than that of any other racial or ethnic group. Now, this is just an idea, but we can cover the presidential race through a network of partnerships, perhaps engineered through NAJA. I can see this being done through a web portal, and the portal would be an interactive gathering place for Native Americans to learn about the presidential candidates and their political platforms, and um, those issues in terms of what's most important to Native Americans, uh, their families, and their tribes. It would also serve as a global forum for people to learn about Native Americans and their lives through digital storytelling, digital content, and digital tools that allow users to connect. It would also serve as an outlet for linking with social media sites, events of interest, important studies and other data, and uh, get out the vote campaigns. Uh, the content would also be available on your mobile device. And we can deliver all of this rich content in our own unique way. I shared with you a story about how I believe I was led to journalism. Whatever reason it is that you made journalism your career path, let's build on that and create a web, a native web work so strong that we won't be ignored in coverage of the next presidential race. Think about it. We could do this. We would need funding, but we could do this. The future is in our hands. It's in our fingertips, really. It could be another extension of the great gift we have as Native people to educate through oral tradition, but in a new way. Thank you for listening.